us. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the both of you brought up some really good points. Um, the reason that this exists, this issue exists in the first place, I think is because one, first of all, this kind of care work, this kind of domestic labor, um, social reproduction, isn't really considered work at all under capitalism um, because it's considered like women's work. And then that's compounded by this other issue that um, that workforce is largely comprised of um, non-white women, immigrant women, immigrant women who speak um, fairly limited English. Um, and one of the things that I realized once I looked deeper into this issue is that um, like a lot of these, um, a lot of this workforce is actually unionized, but they don't really have the support of their union. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit further about what the union response to this has been. Yeah, so first of all, there we have seen several unions um, that have organized these agencies, but 1199 is the most predominant, like in the biggest one and most powerful one. And so what we saw was when workers began filing wage claims in court, the union, 1199 with its agencies, changed the contracts to say that you can't go to court on wage claims. You have to mar uh, arbitrate. That's mandatory arbitration. And that process is controlled by the union. And so even when some workers like the CPC workers said, okay, to the union, can you please arbitrate our claims then? Mm -hmm. Nothing. So, you know, on their cases, six years, more than six years, nothing. No, the end. And the union, one time when the CPC workers met with, they tried so many different ways to get 1199 support, uh, both to end the 24 and to uh, help with their recouping the wages. When they met with the vice president of 1199 um, about these two things, she basically threatened them, uh, saying, like, if you go after, if you're trying to push for your old wages going back six years, that's going to cause the demise of the industry. You're not going to have a job. And so the workers felt, why? how come we have to support the industry with our pay? I mean, that's crazy. It, 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 what kind of industry operates on that model? You know, so I think... Unfortunately, the union has been working more to protect the agencies and just keep things going. So even though they will give lip service um, in informal meetings to the idea of, yes, 24 hours is not good, they what they do in reality is maintain it, keep it going. And... To speak further to that, you know, we are, are seeing throughout the state um, smaller agencies, for-profit agencies, non-unionized uh, agencies as well, sort of tackling these different pieces of what uh, workers like the CPC Home Attendants and the UJC Home Attendants have been calling for, right? Part of that is um, splitting shifts, uh, paying back wages, and increasingly we're starting to see that, which is, I think, also, I think, you know, it's great for the workers, but also very frustrating to see that, um, you know, like Joanne was saying, we have like uh, a very large union, very powerful union in New York City, also really working hard to, you know, tell workers that we shouldn't be demanding more uh, because, you know, suddenly it becomes, the burden is placed on you to think about the sustainability of this larger industry, like, you know, put aside, you know, the very um, burdens that are being placed on your body. Um, do it for, you know, this larger, greater good. So um, I've been to a few of the rallies that you all have organized. And um, I have to say that the most, probably the most powerful part of the rallies has been when you invite uh, some of the home care attendants to speak. And they, um, you know, 
often through a translator, they'll talk about the physical injuries um, that they've sustained and the kinds of um, like mental health issues that um, they have just from working these 24 hour shifts. Because I don't think a lot of people realize that it's not just 24 hour shifts. It's 24 hour shifts for days on end, um, for weeks in a row, sometimes for years at a time. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, like what kinds of, what kind, how does it affect them physically and mentally? And, you know, like what does it do to their um, like family relationships, you know, being away, working 24 hours, you know, for weeks at a time? So many of them <clears throat> have a whole range of health problems we've seen. Some of them are injuries because of accidents they've had on the job resulting from their fatigue. Like um, one, one home care worker, she's in her 40s, and she's had six operations, having, you know, it all related to on the job, like trying to lift the patient or push the patient's wheelchair or, you know, and, and so it's, it's done a number on her back, on her neck. I mean, now she requires a walker. She requires, a, she needs a home care worker herself. And she said that it ruined her life. I mean, she lost her partner. Uh, he just felt like, and this is a common story that um, people say that, their partners just felt like, you know, you're never around. And then <clears throat> with their children, too, many of them speak of how they lost all those years with their children and that now, you know, the children feel like, where were you? Um, and sometimes they lose track of what the kids, you know, got involved in. And so there's a, a lot of regret. And my name is Mary Lister. I'm a home care worker and organizer with the Anti-Woman Campaign. I have the pleasure of introducing May Come True, another home attendant who's been helping to lead the fight against the 24-hour workday. Let's hear it! Uh, so, she say, uh, my name is uh, May Come True. I have been work, uh, 20, um, home care worker at CBC more than 10 years. Uh, I've been working like 24 hour shift for more than five years because the work for care of the, of the patient is really a lot and heavy. I work continu continuously 24 hour for three, four days per week. All my energy is spent on the patient. I wake up three, four times a night to take care of the patient. So I have no way to rest regularly. So the one time I was uh, helping the patient to use the bathroom. In order to not let the patient fall down, I injure my shoulder. I cannot work anymore. So and I become a disabled person. But uh, like she say uh, today. So the legislature proposal uh, speak the voice of us, a home care worker. So we must abolish the 24 hour work day. Because this is an inhumane working environment that treats this industry worker, especially the woman, like the slave. So the home care worker have a lot of responsibility and pressure. So she taking care of the patient day and night. So work like a slave. So uh, um, she say uh, we uh, we also the home care worker also have a family, a children. So every day taking uh, taking a lot of pressure. So we demand the government pass this legislature legislation uh, pass this law to protect the worker and uh, protect the patient. So no more 24 hour shift. At least uh, spread to two shift. And she, uh, we we demand the government to do that. Thanks. In, at this, and so many of the home care workers, including the ones at United Jewish Council that we work with, are older now. And some are retired. And they cannot enjoy their retirement. They are in such pain. So many of them take medication for pain or for to help them sleep. Many of them cannot sleep at home or after they retire. Because it's been years that they are just trained to always be listening, always be on call. And so 
I think that sleep deprivation also and stress has led to a lot of other kind of health problems that we hear from them. And who knows if it's direct, but you know, thyroid, like just all kinds of things, heart problems. And it's rendered many of these women vulnerable during COVID. And so we've actually lost in this about a half dozen of our home care worker members to COVID. And I feel like all those years of 24 hour shifts made it harder for them to be able to fight it off. You know, so in addition to, I think, some of the really physical and social trauma that uh, we've just gone over, you know, there's also, I think, a lot of this psychological um, damage that they go through, you know, trying to navigate um, these shifts as well as the, the messages that they get from their employer as well. You know, I was recently uh, learning about a case of a, a home care worker who had been doing 24 hour shifts uh, and uh, found out at some point that other home care workers were documenting uh, the times where, you know, they weren't allowed, they weren't able to get full sleep. Um, you know, part of, part of the, part of the law says, um, you know, this, uh, 24 hour rule, um, uh, suggests that, you know, these workers are supposed to get five hours of uninterrupted sleep, uh, three hours of uninterrupted meal times. And, you know, as we mentioned earlier, because of the nature of uh, who the 24 hour patient, uh, care patients are, like, you know, they need constant care, whether it be, you know, getting up several times in the night and needing help to go to the restroom or needing to be turned in their, uh, over in their beds every two hours to prevent them getting bed sores. Um, and so, you know, this home, home attendant that I was uh, learning about had been, um, documenting all these times where they had to get up in the middle of the night to, um, to help their patient. And when they presented all of this information to their, uh, to their employer, uh, CPC, um, that, you know, I, you know, documenting all these months of uninterrupted, uh, interrupted sleep and interrupted meals, the immediate reaction that they got from their employer was, you're lying. There's no way that someone was getting up this many times in the night. There's no way that, you know, you're actually working this hard. And, you know, the employee, the home attendant said, no, this is all true. And can I have those times back? And I'll verify that with the, the client and the employer actually like said like, no, I'm not giving this back to you. And we just hold on to it. Um, and later the, the employer actually went to verify it with the, the patient themselves and the patient admitted, yes, I was getting up this many times in the night and um, you know, nothing came of it. Like they were still not being compensated for that time, but there was a lot of this, this, gaslighting and this like psychological like uh, being psychologically on edge all the time because you know they're they feel like their employer is also antagonizing them and you know many of them are very afraid to speak out about not wanting to do 24-hour shifts because employers have been known to threaten employees with you know not being given any additional shifts or just not giving them shifts at all for asking add questions too on the psychological abuse uh, so many workers have spoken about things that happened in their family while they were working. For instance, uh, a sister who died in Honduras or a, a child who um, needed to, to meet with the teacher, all these things, um, and where they could not leave to address these things. Because if you have a shift and they don't provide a replacement for you, <clears throat> doesn't it doesn't matter what's going in your life you have to stay there until someone replaces you and so this is just they're so pained by this like it it, it it it's a message to them that they don't count their lives don't count for anything your your work this is your work that's it 